This is the Wise Guy Radio Show, a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. We will be dissecting their journeys in hopes to deliver actionable content that you, the artist, can start implementing now, helping you grow not only as a creative spirit, but also a successful artistic entrepreneur. With a little organization, relationship building, and your artistic ability, you can obtain greatness. Climb aboard, whether an artist, retail owner, or enthusiast. We have a ton of fun in store for you. Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by American Helix. The American Helix is a revolutionary new concept in smoking technology. Designed and manufactured by American glassblowers, this pipe is light years ahead of its time. Based on Brunoli's principle, the shape of the pipe along with an innovative intake system creates a venturi effect through precision micro holes in the chamber, which results in a slower burn that conserves tobacco and gives a smooth, refreshing smoking experience, making the American Helix the smoothest hitting pipe on the market. For further info or to locate their products, you can find them online at AmericanHelix.com. That's AmericanHelix.com. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Zen Glass Studios. Located in the heart of St. Petersburg, Florida, Zen Glass has a wide range of offerings to choose from. Their menu includes one-on-one or group classes in their hot shop or flame working studio, create your own wine glass, and so much more. If you're a traveling artist, they even have a space to rent that you can temporarily call home. With over 50 years of combined experience, Zen Glass can help you fine-tune your techniques, whether you're a novice or advanced glass artist. For their calendar of events, including info about their third Thursday studio jams, you can contact Zen at zenglass.com. That's zenglass.com. Hey, what's happening? Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show, episode number 158. This is your host, Jason Michael, and thank you so much for tuning in today. With 17 years of experience, well, now 18 years of experience behind the torch, I am as excited as always to bring you conversations with artists, sharing their stories in hopes to inspire and entertain, while helping you grow your business. And today is no exception. Today's episode features a repeat guest, Chris Piazza, a.k.a. Crispy Glass, He's out of Chicago, and he came on back in uh, last year to talk about his humble beginnings and how glass blowing literally saved his life. And Chris is uh, a great example in our industry of an artist that comes from a good background, had a rough path, found the glass, changed his life, turned it around, started a business, and now has a successful running space uh, with several artists working under his belt. And the last time we talked, we were uh, finishing up while he was actually getting ready to go uh, get prepared to go up to Glass Roots for his first trade show. And this episode, we talk about that experience, uh, the the great time he had, the orders that he received, how they went about actually going through the process of taking the orders, uh, manufacturing them, shipping them out, just kind of the ins and outs and sides of the whole process of a new artist going to a trade show, which I found was very fascinating. And being that myself still have yet to get to a trade show, um, I'm, I'm still curious myself in the whole process. Uh, there's the right way to do it, and then there's the wrong way to do it. And I think the way Chris went about doing his first trade show um, was a little bit of both. And we definitely talk about that whole idea of where he went wrong, what he could have done differently, now that he knows what to do differently, to what, how to approach it next time. Um, especially when you're a new artist starting off and trying to find your way and your groove and your lines of work, the worst thing you can do is have like say 20 items that you want to go sell, and if you get a hundred shops that want one of each, you've got 2,000 pieces you got to make, and then you got to think about the time and the labor and blah blah blah. So we get into all that stuff and how to really calculate and set yourself up to have the most successful trade show. But also, is this information you can take and put it into just business in general. So I definitely had a lot of fun talking about it. Uh, don't forget right now also that Mountain Glass has their sales going on right now, our, our sponsors for the show, uh, one of several that we have. And thank you all to our sponsors and for all of you out there who are supporting our sponsors. Uh, you can go to mountainglass.com right now and get a shot. Actually, you know what? I take it back. Hold on one second. I'll be right back. 
So as I was saying, Mountain Glass right now for the month of May, I'm still stuck on my April recordings here. Uh, right now, the Borosilicate sale they have right now, you can get Troutman first quality rod at 30% off. Just put in the code TAG, that's T-A-G at checkout. And for all you soft glass nerds that have their soft glass COE 104 sale, Creations is Messy at 30% off. Just put in the code Messy, M-E-S-S-Y. And they've also got their kiln sales. They've got supplies and torches right now. They've got a Bethlehem on sale. They've got a Nortel Red Max on sale. They've got a couple different kilns. Uh, take advantage of these sales. I mean, shit, right now they've got a Paragon F500 front loading kiln, uh, 240 volt. It's 24 by 22 and a quarter by 18 inches. Big sum bitch. Uh, right now it is regularly priced at $3,610 and it is on sale for $2,888. That's almost eight. Oh, I guess it's about eight hundred dollars off their sale right now. So definitely take advantage of that. That's pretty big, um, you know. And like I've said in the past with sales, these are the kind of sales you want to take advantage of because it costs a shit ton of money to have a kiln delivered. It's going to cost anywhere from one hundred fifty to two hundred fifty dollars to have a kiln delivered. So if you get a kiln on sale, not only will you be saving money on the cost of the kiln, you're more or less getting free shipping out of it. So take advantage. Just go to mountainglass.com for more sales. Uh, use it on their front homepage. They have a little sales button there you can hit and uh, check them out. And uh, any other questions, comments, and concerns, go to mountainglass.com. Uh, and yeah, so that being said, uh, Chris and I had a great conversation, and I definitely enjoyed it. And I hope you guys enjoy it as well. And on one other note, um, I'm still dealing with some bullshit. I'm actually borrowing a friend's laptop right now. My laptop was my daughter's laptop. Um, uh, I guess... I. I hate to even talk about this on the show. I really don't want to, but I'm going to talk about it anyways. So currently, I'm going through a divorce right now, and my uh, soon-to-be ex-wife, uh, and it's a long story, and it's it's a, kind of a shitty situation, um, but I've gotten through it and gotten kind of gotten past this whole thing now, um, partially why I took the month of March off. Um, but that being said, um, I used to use her laptop, and I was saving up to buy my own laptop, and the expenses came up, and blah, blah, blah. So now I'm still in the process of saving up, but my daughter had a laptop. And I fixed the screen because my son had broken it about two weeks after she had this thing. And my, at the time, my, they were, it was like four years ago. So we finally got around. We found the right serial numbers, got the laptop fixed. And I did a system restore, and the operating system completely pooped out. And it was asking me for my administration password. And we don't know the password. So now we're fucked. And it's basically a paperweight now. So if anybody out there knows anything about how to get past that part of... Uh, understanding to break down the computer so I can not, I can actually redo it without having to have this administrative password. Hit me up on Instagram. Uh, you can s send me an email, wiseguyradio at gmail.com, or actually wiseguymedia at gmail.com. Sorry. Um, I would love to find out about it because I'm, I'm, I don't want to spend the money right now if I can help it just because I'm in this transition of getting my own space and place and etc. Um, but I definitely need some help finding a way to get this laptop running because I got to get keep the show going. And with the move I'm about to make, um, I probably will have access to some computers and stuff. And I really don't want to record through my microphone, uh, my earbuds into my app that I have on my phone. If I have to, I have to. Um, I've already got about seven interviews already up and recorded and ready to go and launch. It's just getting them uh, into Dropbox, which I've already done most of them. It's just now I'm going through and doing my intros, which I'm doing now for this one. So, I, again, I appreciate everybody's patience. I apologize for not following through and, and having episodes come out like I really wanted to. Um, we are still in pre-launch for our upcoming classes in July we're launching, which means also that i got to get on the computer and or even just start using my phone uh, for Facebook Live videos, um, which I'm, my next schedule for work comes out here next week. And I'll be posting up uh, when I'll be doing my Facebook Live videos so you all can come on there. Um, I'm going to be creating a brand new Facebook page community group for this podcast. Um, it's going to be for students only that are signing up for our classes, just kind of an FYI. Uh, it's a little extra side bonus. But I am going to be putting up another community page here very soon, uh, specifically for everybody that wants to come on board. Um, I know, you know there's a huge community on Torch Talk and lots of other groups that are out there. Um, but I really want to have something exclusive for you, for the audience, for our community on this show. I do have the Wise Guy Radio Facebook page already that I do post, and I really just use that for a platform for posting up new episodes. I might take more advantage of maybe just using that for you guys. I don't know. Let me know what you think about it. Um, but I think ideally what I want to have is more of a private group that I can screen those coming in because I don't want to have... I hate to say it, but I don't want to have 7,000 members in it. I want to have it be super exclusive. Um, so it's, it's kind of a catch-22. So we'll see how it goes. But just stay tuned for that. I'll be announcing that pretty soon. Um, I'll probably put a link onto 
uh, my Instagram as well as onto the Facebook. And you can find me on Instagram. Um, I have my personal, I actually have three Instagram pages now, but I have my personal, which is my J Michael Glass, all one word, J M I C H A E L Glass. That's where I do all my posts for my work and just things going on behind the scenes over at the Mouse House. And then also I have the Wise Guy Radio Instagram page. It's Wise Guy Radio underscore, or it's Wise Guy at Wise Guy underscore radio. And then if you want to follow me on my other one, um, I have a little Olaf Zoom Zoom that I take with me on adventures and have him all over the place. I'll put a note, a little link for that one. It's, it's hard to, to, to I, feel, don't, I honestly don't even remember the tag for it. I think it's like, I know it's the frozen one, but I don't remember what exactly how it got done. So Anyways, I'm rambling because I'm in a hurry to get the hell out of here to go get my kids from school. So that being said, enjoy this episode. I believe we are now on episode 158. It might be 159. I don't know. Here, let me double check. This is ridiculous, but I'm going to let you know where we are because I think it's 158. <sighs> yes, 158. All's right. Sweet. So, all right. Enjoy this episode. Again, Chris Piazza, a.k.a. Crispy Glass, with a K. Check him out on Instagram, at Crispy Glass. And we'll talk to you on the next episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show. Love you. Take care of yourself. Be good. Happy Melton. And it's summertime, so start staying hydrated even more so than you have before. Take care. Bye-bye. Peace. Hey, Chris, welcome back to the show, brother. Hey, how's it going? Pretty good, man. It's uh, awesome to have you back on. Uh, last time we talked was on 118, and if you have not listened to 118 out there, uh, definitely go back and check it out. It was uh, a great chat, uh, sharing Chris's journey and through his struggles in life and finding glass and really feeling that glass was kind of the motivation in, in a sense that kind of, I guess, saved your life and, you know, as, as we had talked about oh, yeah. and, you know, got you moving forward and, and has allowed you to fulfill your dreams in a sense of being a homeowner and having a business and a studio and everything else. And it's pretty awesome. So definitely go back and check it out on 118. And uh, today we're going to talk about more or less from where we ended the last episode. You're gearing up for uh, Glass Roots last year in 2016. And uh, you've been really, uh, you know, I guess... Uh, in the business sense of finding ways to sell your work, whether through Facebook groups or contacting local shops or distributors. And you definitely don't hold back on getting your work out there. And then you decided to try the trade show. So I definitely want to talk about that. But to kind of catch up real quick, last time we talked um, was in July of last year. So from July to August, um, I guess let's kind of go into the... You see, I guess from that point, you had the you had your studio, you had three or four artists in the studio working for you, and you guys were doing your production line. So I guess... In your headspace, what was it, I guess, gearing up for the trade show? Uh, did you find that you had to be at, like, in, I guess I'm trying to how to word this, like, how to say this properly, just in terms of getting prepared? Like, what were there steps that you took, to, you know, to plan out your line for the trade show? Does that make sense? You know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, you know, I guess uh, to circle back just a tad, I get, you know, um, you know, while glasses and art, you know, it is also a business. Um, and I, you know, it's those two things that really attract me to this. That's what really kind of got me going with everything. Um, you know, to be able to have something for myself that was also providing for me. Um, so I really kind of stepped back pretty far from the artistic thought processes going into Glassroots and really took it as, you know, a hundred percent like business. Okay. So what does the market want? Like what, what have I been hearing about these, you know, in last year's trade or I went uh, the year before to Glassroots and I saw like, you know, some beautiful, beautiful work everywhere. But what I didn't see was production. And so I really, um, I really set up, I, I set a, I set us up for going and attacking that need, um, that, that, uh, that I saw. And so it was really, um, it was really, 
a shift in, in creating product lines, taking everything that I've, I've done over the last, you know, eight years and, you know, getting some different price points between like a dollar and 50 bucks and having options within that. Um, so we basically went with, uh, 45 different production lines and, um, just had one of each and, you know, we, but that was the thing that we did was we actually sat and made, you know, personally, I, I, I prefer to do 50 of something, not one of something. But mm-hmm. so for a couple of weeks we spent, you know, making one of each of the different styles. And, you know, I still have that sample case today that we took to Glassroots. Um, yeah, of each of the different styles that we make. And then I made a catalog and did all that stuff. So really the mindset was, um, you know, how do I show everything that I, I can offer um, all at once? And I mean, it was, a, you know, excuse the French, but it was a pain in the ass to do, you know, one of each thing and have 45 different samples. Um, but it worked out. I mean, we killed it. Yeah, um, yeah it's awesome. Yeah, about 15,000 in sales. So Fuck you yeah, know, for bro. a first show, yeah, dude, it was, uh, it was intense. And then, uh, it, you know, we were, we were hoping for our, our goal was five grand. And if we would hit 10, then that would have been, you know, insane. And I think it was like 14,600 bucks or something like that after giving the discounts that we were giving. Um, that was our, yeah, that was our final, uh, sales and man, we got back to the shop and it was like, okay, now what do we do? <laughs> you know, like. I, I mean, I, that was the, that was the next thing. Like, I, I was all worried about preparing for Glassroots. I had no idea what it was going to be like to have that many orders. And and these are orders that are from new customers, yeah. you know? So it's not even like these are recurring orders with guys that I'm on a, you know, first name basis and worked with for years. So, like, I need to make sure that all these people are happy that, have, you know, put their first order ever in with me. And uh, I think that was the most stressful part of the whole thing. Yeah, man, it makes sense because yeah, because your reputation's on the line, you know, and the integrity of right. as being a business. Because I know in the past when I've I've had that same kind of idea where and and did where I had a production line, I had like twenty one items or twenty two items that I was doing. Anything from like a basic one hitter that you're saying like a dollar fifty piece up to like a twenty five to thirty five dollar bubbler we were doing at the time, and when we put the catalog out and we thought about it, it was like, man, if we say, if we hit 10,000 smoke shops and like 1% orders and they all order <laughs> 50 of each item or whatever it's going to be, it's like, how in the hell are we going to keep up with this demand? You know? Right. So it's like, you know, you can kind of, uh, you know, overshoot the moon per se, you know, and then you get the reality of like what it is when you get home. So what was the next step in the, in the game plan? Did you guys have to like take all your samples, right? You know, cause obviously you had invoices and what have you for what your orders were. So what was that next step you guys took? Well, and um, so there was a little bit of turnover with guys in my shop. And one of the guys that started working in here um, just got done with uh, getting his MBA. And um, so I was able to kind of, you know, it's nice when you have people with um, an understanding of business in general. He was able to kind of sit down with me and we were talking about, you know, how to attack this. And, you know, we had 45 different lines and it was a handful of almost everything. So there was no real way to get into a flow, you know, per se to, you know, knock everything out. But what we did was we basically listed everything from quantity, like the the biggest quantity. And we knocked out, you know, the top 10 items or top seven items that were the highest quantities and then put those all in the different orders, like in little boxes for each of the different orders and then went back to um to look at what was left on each order and then fill those individually does that make sense yeah yeah absolutely yeah absolutely so that was how we found to be able to get through it which in a in a sense i don't know if i want to do that this year because what you end up doing is not being able to ship anything out for a few weeks right exactly and then you have like five things to ship out at once so financially speaking that put me in a in a heck of a bind um, you know, I didn't make any money for like a month after Glassroots, Um, and then I had a bunch come in, which was great. But, um, the other thing was that you end up putting all of these, like we, like I was saying, the brand new customers, you know, nobody's getting anything in the first few weeks. So, you know, nobody was upset about that. Um, they, I've already had some recurring orders from them, which is great. Beautiful. Um, but for me, I think I would rather, um, I think what we're going to do is actually have a uh, number system on on our invoices this year 
that's going to, you know, tell us who who ordered when. Like one of the last orders that went out was the one of the first people that ordered from us. Mm. And like to me, you know, I don't know if they think about it because most of the time they forget about everything by the time they leave. Mm-hmm. Um, but you don't. But for me, right, exactly. That was what I was thinking about. And it was the biggest order that was put in. It was like twenty six hundred dollars. It was the last one that went out. It was just like I didn't feel right about that. So yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it's it's, it's a funny system too, because like you know, at forty five items, that's all, I mean, that's a lot of stuff. Do you guys think that right. if you cut back, if you scaled back the the lists to like say half of that, and then just increase the prices a little bit, that it would it would be more beneficial because you would have less product going out, or I mean, you may have more product going out too, but also you can in, increase the revenue a little bit on that end. And I, I um, I've definitely thought about that quite a bit. Um, so uh, this year. We, so, um, I'm working on, you know, with the taxes being around and everything, I'm going to circle back, but, uh, with taxes and everything going on, I've been looking at my books and I've found some, uh, flaws in how I've been keeping my accounting. One of those things being my SKU numbers for each of my product lines has been kind of messy. So I'm getting that in order so that I'm going to do this for one more year and then figure out which things are the, uh, which things aren't even selling. Like if I sell five of something in a year, it's not worth having it in my product line. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what my next year plan is. This year, I think we're going to stick to what we're doing just one more time so that I can have the real data to be able to move forward properly. If yeah, that makes sense. Ab- yeah, absolutely, man. I know like in the, in the years when I worked at Subway beforehand, before doing my glass, I, mean, I was there for seven years and, and getting a chance to do in the management side of things and doing whatever, all of our sales you know, predictions or whatever you want to say, were all based on the previous year's stuff. And our inventory that we purchased was based on that, you know, et cetera. So it's, it's definitely smart, you know, which is why I preach it, you know, in November or December to do a year a reflection on the year. Cause then you can really see like everything you sold, what sold the best, when it sold, where it sold, how much of it, blah, 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 blah. And a lot of times, like, you know, when you're trying to sell an item that you're selling a shit ton of it, maybe you should increase the price just a smidge, even if it's like 5%, that might stop some folks from buying it, but those that will buy it and will continue to buy it, and they'll buy maybe the same amount of quantity or more, but you're going to still make the same amount of money, I guess, in a sense. Right, right, totally. You know, and something else I kind of figured out is that, you know, with selling on Facebook, most of those times are are cases that I built and then I sold. So I end up having a uh, a skewed data, skewed data there because... Like for instance, my favorite thing to make, um, you know, in my in my pro- product line at least is uh, my fume honeycombs and fume wigwax. So those I sell, you know, a shit ton compared to everything else. But that's because that's what I'm putting out in the market the most. Mm-hmm. So of course I'm selling that the most, you know. So sometimes the data isn't actually telling a true story um, versus Subway where you actually have everything out all the time and then the customer decides. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's why, like this year, it's all going to be like we're, I'm really pushing my catalog a lot more, um, and so the, the you know the market's telling me what to make, yeah, versus me you know bringing it to the market. So then now I'll have some real data and be able to move forward. Yeah, it's smart, and, man. Because uh, I know like myself personally over the years, I've always done like uh, you know made to order kind of stuff. I've rarely ever kept right. inventory, and and when I had inventory, it was for my my distributor type of deal, you know, because there's a dip, huge difference from having a shop buy a case off you from a shop placing an order than having to make it. And then when you have the amount of orders that you got, you know, and that being said, I want to back up to that. How, how long time frame wise did it take you guys from when you got the orders to get them everything like your last order done and out the door? Um, last order and out the door was I think February 2nd. So it was about three and a half months. Um, and that also includes, you know, Christmas and new years and mm-hmm. all that. So, um, it was, you know, give or take about three months. And, um, you know, again, I wasn't super happy about that, but, um, you know, Murphy's law, when we, uh, when we got back from the show, my, uh, my main apprentice ended up hurting his hand really bad and wasn't able to work for like two weeks. And then, uh, another guy became just a complete flake and he's no longer with the shop anymore. Um, and so like I had all this, all this drop off, like right after the show. And, uh, so that was just a mess. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah but, it's about three months, huh? Yeah, and but with your personality, you're definitely uh, one to persevere and get past those obstacles and just do what you got to do. Have to. There's no, you know, that's the only way we can. I mean, you know, a lot of kids get into this thinking like, oh, you know, I'm gonna, 
I'm going to make pipes and partake in, uh, you know, certain things and it's going to be great. And it's like, well, that's fine. If you, you know, if you don't have any bills, like have fun with it. But like, I don't know, man, I got a mortgage, I got a car to pay for, you know, I, I have insurance and it's like, and I don't have choices. I gotta, I gotta bust out all the time. So, yep. Yeah. And you're treating it like a business, not just as like a fun side hustle or a hobby, you know? Right. It's a big right. difference for sure. Do you, do you, <laughs> do you see that you're like, can you already tell certain items that you would cut back now if you were to cut back on the 40, some of the 45? Uh, yeah, probably. Um, some like surface work stuff, you know, there, there's some items in like the one to $10 range that I like to have, um, because of my apprentices, like, um, just to make sure that they have some work to do. Um, so, but yeah, there's, there's a handful of stuff that, you know, they don't really sell too well. Um, like, you know, some, uh, you know, off of 32, some striped, they, there's like eight stripes and you twist it. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, just really basic stuff like that. You know, it's stuff that like, even if you're crushing it, you can only do, you know, maybe five in an hour. And, you know, so that's, that's nice. It's like 35 bucks an hour, you know, before materials and everything. But, you know, that's, these guys have a hard time even, you know, maintaining that type of a pace. So, yeah, yeah, it's hard. That's why like a lot of times when I, when I teach about like the concept of doing timing yourself, you should do like a three hour stint, you know? Right. Cause it, like you're saying, yep. yeah, cause it's really hard to keep that pace. I know myself like, fuck dude, I, you know, there were times where I was doing like little three inch wrapping rakes and I was making like 20 an hour of those pieces. Right. But after like three or four hours, I was good to go. And then about five hours into it, I'm like, I'm dead. And then I'm dead for like a day or two after that. So it's, right. Right. you know, it's definitely the marathon, not a sprint kind of concept. But again, it was cause I was going back to like either selling to a distributor and having to have a hundred of this and a hundred of that, or I was trying to keep up with orders that were coming in. So it's, right. you know, it's interesting. Cause I think the thing with the trade show, which is smart, like you did is just to bring samples. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, I mean, you can bring some work to sell, you know, maybe some higher end pieces or whatever, but like, you know, to go with samples and then just keep those samples for as long as you can keep them for down the road and not right. get, you know, exactly not try to sell them. Cause like I used to have a piece of cardboard kind of thing on the wall. It was like a little hanger that we would zip, like to zip tie the pieces to our samples to. And just so we had the physical samples on hand and it, it made a big difference. We'd put the SKU number underneath it. So we knew the catalog number, you know, the, the price of it, the whole nine yards and, totally. uh, had like our wall art in a sense, you know, but it made for a good reference. And, and that being said, do you, do you break down like the formula for how, what goes into a piece? Like, you know, it's three inches of 32 and then like yeah. two, you know, color wise of the whole nine yards. Yep. I mean, not so much with color cause uh, it varies so much. Um, but as far as size goes, yeah, I mean, um, I have, so basically every tube, you know, is, you know, five feet or whatever. Um, so we do 16 pieces out of every tube. If I need more glass, I go to one size up. I know some people rather add an inch of tubing. Um, and that's fine for like, you know, artistic pieces, like obviously, but, um, for me, I just do, there's 16 pieces out of a tube. If I need a bigger piece, I go to a, um, a bigger tube. And then that way it's really simple. Whenever these guys, all I have to do is tell them what size tube it is. And then they know like, okay, there's 16 out of this too. Break it in half, break it in half, break it in half one more time. And then that's their, that's their, uh, prep, you know? So it makes it really consistent that way. Yeah. It's smart. Are you, do you guys pull points or do you do blow pipes? Um, points on anything that's, uh, 25 and then, uh, blow tubes, anything above that. Cool. Heck yeah. yeah. Is it just for yeah. like st a stability kind of thing or is it just because of what you're making? Um, just, you know, it, I don't know. I, I, I learned to go on to blow tubes at 32, 25 is just really easy to, you know, pull a point off of. So is 32, but, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just kind of what I've done. Also, there's no loss that way mm -hmm. with, uh, with the size of the tube or the 32. So it kind of gives a little extra weight to it. Not that it's very much, but it's more about the consistency. If I wasn't lazy, I would probably do it, do blow tubes on 25 as well, because then everything is exactly the same. It's not like, and we're talking about grams here, but mm -hmm. you know, when, when you're, when it comes down to something that's 30 grams, 35 grams is a lot, you know, it, it feels different. So, you know, that's where, uh, 
it's just a consistency. Yeah, it makes I, sense. What I like about flow tubes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I, I think the pull and point process is a must when you first learn this process, just because there's so many fundamental totally. techniques that are involved in pulling. I mean, there's so many. 100%. Like this online course I'm doing, like this, the first thing I'm gonna teach is how to pull a point, just because you know you get to understand everything. But uh, yep. you know, it, but they do add up, man. It's amazing. <laughs> You know, oh, you yeah. get like a month of points and all those handles. It's like you got like four pounds of clear glass sitting there. It's like, fuck. Yep. And that was what? Ten pipes? You yeah. know, it's like, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, something that you uh, you mentioned about glass roots and having all our different samples. Um, you know, this year we're also going to be trying to have some more one offs um, and things like that to be able to have some cash because that was one of the bummers of the show. Um, the guys next to us were actually all cash and carry and, you know, they, between three of them, they made like, you know, $8,000 or something like that. And like, they got to walk home with, you know, a few thousand dollars a piece in cash. And we had all these orders, which was great, but it was like, you know, I think a little bit of both is going to be a good, good plan for this year. Yeah. Um, yeah. I agree, great. man. Yeah. You get that little runway to get you through the, the production. I think that what you guys right. did though, is a little smarter than going there because, it allows you to really, on a business level, to figure out which costs are, which profits are, the whole nine yards, instead of having this chunk of cash and you have to go home and then break everything down and potentially spend some of that money while you're there or what, you know. You, right, get, you right. get eight grand in your pocket and it's, it's easy to go blow it all in fucking five minutes. I know I could. <laughs> well, it's it's harder in Madison than it is in Vegas, but yeah, definitely. Oh, dude, I could find a way to spend a hundred grand there in a day. <laughs> I promise. I <laughs> promise. Nice, I'll drive home nice. in a new RV or some shit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Nice. Um, that's hilarious. Yeah. One other thing that's kind of exciting over here, um, and I'm I'm extremely nervous about doing this, um, but uh, picking up a Red Star. So we're going to have our first lathe in here. Hmm. Um, starting in a couple, uh, we're getting in about four to six weeks. So uh, we're also going to have a lathe line, uh, you know, a lathe made, line for uh glass roots this year as well beautiful so that's going to be something else that's new so is glass yeah. is, that, is the glass roots going to be like your main go-to trade show yeah for the, for this year we're just going to do that one um and then we're talking about what our plan for 2018 is um yeah then then we'll we'll expand a little bit more but just wanted to really have the full experience this last year um and then that kind of screwed us to be able to get to vegas um because it was just so late in the year by that point to be able to, you know, sign up, you know, and get a booth. So we just yeah. threw it to the back burner. Yeah, but it's smart, man, because like the process of going first to the trade show and scouting it out and seeing what you need and what you're not, you know, finding what the white space is to fill that that gap, which you guys fucking did, obviously, you know, and now you've gone through the process and you've learned what to do, what not to do, how to change things, how to scale differently, blah, blah, blah. And now you go do glass roots again, you'll be way more prepared. And then you guys can get geared up for age in the spring or whatever you're going to do right right that's the plan that's the plan um yeah we're gonna yeah we'll see how it goes this year and yeah go forward from there um yeah like i said we're gonna i'm trying to have like three three or four different lines for the laid stuff and then um yeah it's you know it, the other thing that's sweet about having uh having these samples because like you said you had that board up um uh, we still have we still have a gun case or two gun cases of all of our samples and um, took them down to a shop that I haven't been to yet uh, down in Chicago and got a $2,000 order because we had our sample case. Exactly. Um, so that was one other thing that uh, that works out from that. I don't know, we're kind of bouncing around a little bit, but no, no, yeah. it's, that's good because that's, I think that's important because, you know, having those samples, you know, my distributor that and he taught me that he would go around with his case of his samples and. And then in his car, he had all the merchandise. So he would say, you know, they want five of this, five of that. He'd come back in with the thing, with an invoice, write them a fucking invoice. They hand him a check or cash, and boom, out the door. Totally. You know, totally. and if you guys get to that point, too, where you can have that, where you can have a little bit of inventory on hand in the in the outside waiting for you, you know, because then you can go out there and just grab that shit and just come back inside and get her done. Yeah, and I, you know, and I just don't understand how guys are pulling that, <clears throat> excuse me, how guys are pulling that off. I mean... I just can't keep inventory and I, you know, I, I need to sell everything before I can, uh, yeah, I just, I just can't get there. I don't know if, uh, you know, there's some supplemental income type of situations, but like, I don't know, man, I, I, uh, I'm envious of those guys. Well, think you know, about guys, like, well, go on. I'm sorry. Oh no, I was just saying, I just saw on Facebook, some guys coming down from this in the spring and I know the Oregon guys do it too, you know, and they just got a van full of cases, you know, and it's mm -hmm. just like, 
and I can't, I can't have seventy thousand dollars in inventory. Like I need that seventy thousand dollars, you know. Yeah. But go ahead. Yeah, because I was gonna say, like, you know, in terms of the production side of things, you know, if if you sit and think of like, you know, if say you make fifty pieces, and then ten of those pieces you just put aside for your locals, and then the forty that you are making you put aside for the orders that you're getting, you know, kind of thing, or every five pieces you put one aside, you know, kind of deal and just keep, keep that side hustle going to just keep stocking it up and forget about that. You have that shit, you know, and just, you know, maybe limit yourself to like 20 of each item that you have on hand all the time, you know, and always keep that inventory going. So when you go hit your shops, if you sell, you know, say you have 20 on hand, you go sell 15, you know, I know you got to, you know, next, next couple of weeks, you need to refill that stock and get it back up to 20 pieces, you know, or something like that. And then every time you guys get to the level of having 20 of each item back in stock, then you go back and hit the road and hit the shops or something, you know, something of that nature, some kind of cyclical kind of gimmick going on. So you can keep all aspects of your business rolling. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. I like that. And even the idea of just like throwing like one or two out of each batch that I make in a box and just like, that's kind of like a savings account, you know, and like Mm -hmm. just stash it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, dude. I like that. I like that. Yeah, and I know it's not easy to do. You know, I mean, I can sit here and talk <laughs> no. about it all day, and actually doing it is another whole other thing. <laughs> you know? Totally, totally. Yep, yep. You and know, but the, you know, mortgages do the mortgages do. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's like when I when I was talking to Micro about stuff, and he's doing his his milli work that he's doing takes him three fucking months to get the milli work done, much less than put it into a piece and then manufacture it, etc. You know, but then he goes to age, and then he sells out in like the first four hours or whatever. You know, crazy timing wise, that you know. It, you know exclusivity and blah 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 but to you know to get to a level which i'm sh- i'm sure you, you guys will get to that point to where you can't afford to have a little bit of stuff that you can put to the side or hustle for six months and not have to worry about paying your bills because you know your bills are getting paid already because you have that money put aside right right you know yeah it's like the squirrel fund i heard i heard dave ramsey talk about a lot about that, like that with with small business owners and having this squirrel fund that you just you know the winter time you got to go get your you know put your nuts away and then Come spring, you got the money there waiting for you to pay your bills. Because as an, I know as an artist, it's 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 a little bit different for the the functional community because it's like a year round thing now. And you know, in terms of like not worrying about right. you know tourism and all that kind of shit. But like here in Florida, our industry is like, which is one of the reasons I don't really sell too much locally, is because our industry here had the ebbs and flows are very similar to like the restaurants and stuff, where it's like you have your good seasons and your bad seasons. And a lot of places, you know, they'll close in the off season just because there's nobody coming in. You know, now we have all the Canadians in town. Like I'm right down the street from the Blue Jay Stadium for spring training. So like our whole area right now is all the Canadians are in town (laughs) and, uh, you know, all these fucking Blue Jay fans. (laughs) (laughs) I'm always yelling at them as I go down the street, you know, go raise and whatever. It's it's fun to harass them. But they, you know, they're they're a huge part of our stimulus to our economy here. And it's, you know, if you can think about based on your locale, wherever you are, you've got some kind of ebbs and flows going on, you know, don't matter where you are. So I got to prepare for it for the days that you don't have the businesses. Cause like when I did the Renaissance festival, when I was first doing this glass back in the day, the, the guy that I worked for, he would do that. He would go do the tour for like eight months and we would do inventory on, on site also our production stuff, doing demonstrations. But like summertime from, I think it was like July until September ish. We were just the whole summer. We were just, cranking out as much shit as we could so when the season started they had a crap ton of inventory hanging up and ready to go and then we would just work on site just to keep the inventory gaps filled and then they would sell most of their shit and then go back to the summertime of sweating and doing production all right you right know? so that's yep. you got to definitely you know and it's it gets to the point to where it's just all about making a plan being organized establishing some kind of calendar of events so you can see what's up what's coming you know just being super organized and then planning ahead and some things you can't plan for, but really when it comes down to if, if you can have a vision of what you want and what you want to succeed at and what you want to have in your life and your business and whatever, then you can make some kind of plan of attack to get there. Definitely. And that, that actually brings up uh, one other piece I didn't, didn't uh, mention as far as how we got through the grassroots bubble that we had. Um, you know, my, uh, my girlfriend is all about setting schedules and like, I don't know, she's got a planner in every room. She's crazy about that stuff. But, um, that helped me be able to schedule myself like down to, um, you know, throughout each day, what my plan was to get things done. And then I have a buddy that, um, is, uh, you know, he does big, um, high scale production for not, not glass, like plastics and stuff like that. 
and he helped me kind of break things down because he was saying that like each of the parts that they make that go together to make one item, um, they have a, a, an amount of time per piece. And then they have, you know, it all set up in Excel to be able to determine how long each item will get, how long it takes to make each part for each item that is going to be completely assembled. And so that was uh, something else I did to kind of get a schedule going. And now I'm trying to do that continuously just with myself kind of giving myself an order. Like, okay, I have no orders right now, but I'm going to make, you know, 50 of these, 50 of these, 50 of these. And if an order comes in in the meantime, I just scrap it. I put what I'm, what my plan was to the side and I take care of the order. Um, but you know, that's yeah. Schedules, man. I, I never really uh, gave it much validity, but it definitely made a difference for me. Yeah. It's, it's huge, man. I know myself personally, you know, working at home, you know, it's, it's so easy to get distracted from the dishes or the yard or the dogs or, you know, whatever, you know, got to yep. have that discipline. But I, I always find myself when, when you can set a schedule, cause working and having my gig, I'm on a schedule and it makes it so my life is easier to plan because I'm on a schedule, you know, and it, and I'm like right now looking at my little studio here and looking at my calendar, like my next month and a half is completely planned out. Like I've got the next, I mean, really I have the next 90 days planned out on a calendar because I know my schedule at work. Right. I know my schedule of here at the podcast interviews, you know, I'm doing this pre-launch for this online course, the whole nine yards. And I had to sit down and really make a 90 day plan of like this week's this, this week's this, this week's this, and there's the days off and the timing. It's just, and then when you see that shit, man, it's like it gets all that shit out of your head and allows you to focus on the important stuff mm -hmm. instead of sitting around yep. contemplating about, oh, what do I have to do tomorrow and, you know, whatever else. It's just it, it can become overwhelming and just to empty the, the brain space. There's a uh, I can't. Oh, David Allen, this guy uh, created a series uh, called Getting Things Done or GTD. They call it for short. And it's an awesome, actually awesome podcast, but also great audio book. And uh Actually, that with that being said, it was a quick little plug. If you haven't, you know, for those out there that listen to audiobooks or much less podcasts here, uh, you can go to audibletrial.com forward slash wise guy radio and get a free 30 day trial download of a book. And if you haven't yet, I recommend getting the book, Getting Things Done. And it's a, a breakdown on how to really organize your life. I mean, it has you take like two days and just get all your paperwork, all your files, all your everything you have and on a table, and then it helps you walk through the process of going through what's important, what's not, what can you take care of now, what's like a down the road thing. And then once you can get that all planned out, man, it's amazing how free your brain becomes, you know? It's just, it's crazy. Even just going through the intro of this book, because he has like the introduction and, and the overall summary of it, and then he actually has the plan. And just going through the summary was, I mean, I have a file cabinet now that's completely organized for, for month to month to month. I would keep all my paperwork, receipts, invoices, everything in that shit. You know, it's, nice. it's huge. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it's, it's funny. Cause like, it's one of those things that, um, at least I had to relearn because when I, you know, when I first started, I was doing, um, you know, batches of a thousand wrapping rakes, a thousand fume spoons, a thousand, you know, whatever. Um, it was all batches of a thousand. And what I learned then was like, do 50 cobalt wrapping rakes in a row and mm -hmm. then do 50 Ruby in a row. And it's like, not having to think as if I can as much thinking as I can get out of my way as far as what I need to do, that allows me to be so much more free while I'm working. I mean, yeah, it just uh, it's incremental difference. I mean, it's a, a substantial difference. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, and and then it gives you the the space and the energy to then get into the creative space when you want to be free and not have to have a schedule or production unless you know blah blah blah, and you can just take a day off. Like I was trying to get to a point where like Wednesdays was like my, my experimental have fun day, not production, you know, and just do something that's maybe not even functional, just do some sculpture or whatever, just right, to, just right. to have that outlet. And, and I think that's, what's interesting with our, with our industry and the dichotomy of it. It's like, there's the two different variations of glass blowers. There's like the production creative, and then there's the creative, you know, but even the creative had to learn the production first to learn the medium to then get to a point to where they can afford to be the creative. Totally. You know, and it takes a long time, man. Like the Joe Peters of the world, you know, that dude's been at, at the torch for a long, long, long time. And he's gone through and, and learned so much shit where now he can make six figures a year and, and travel the world and help out people around the world and create art and inspire. But it takes a long, I mean, it's, you know, I consider all of us to be 20 year overnight successes, you know, right. <laughs> it's, totally. You know, well, look at, you know, a local guy up here, cold drink. I mean, I've seen some of his, uh, my uh, distributor I was working with used to distribute stuff when he first started. 
And like he handed me this inside out spoon. I'm like, oh, right on. He's like, do you know who made that? I'm like, no. He's like, that's a cold drink piece. That's an original. I'm like, holy shit. Like, you know, cold drink doing those flip discs that are incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, he just started out making inside out spoons, you know, like just like the rest of us. It's like, yeah. I mean, I'm still stuck in that uh, production uh, production phase. I'm, I'm working on trying to do some other stuff now, finally. Um, but I was, yeah, I mean, uh, I, that's the dream, right? To be able to have, like, some time to be able to do other things and just doing uh, stuff to pay the bills. And then those things can pay the bills later on. Yeah, exactly. But, exactly. Especially, like, where you're at, you know, and having a studio with apprentices and stuff or, you know, helpers with, with you. You know, you'll get to a point to where you can have them strictly doing your production lines and you're there creating new production lines, doing R and D and then also being the creative and making the one offs, you know, as the business yep. maintains itself in a sense. Because that's what it's all about. You know, if you can get to a point where you can scale yourself and scale your business to where you have those guys making your stuff and then you're running the business. Because, you know, like you're saying, bro, there's there you know, you're you're fortunate to have a circle of friends around you, including someone in your studio that understands business. And then your girlfriend understanding scheduling and organization, and you have a friend who's doing manufacturing of other things, but still understands that. And it's so important to have that influence around you, you know, and not just being in your cave and just doing your thing, trying to figure this shit out. Like reach out to your friends that have specialties in other areas that may be able to help you out. We like to think we're special, but when it comes down to it in the production side, like, you know, Coca-Cola is a production, you know, is a production business. It's it's not very different from what we're doing when we're making a thousand fume spoons, you know, and it's like these people have that insight that can really help. And yeah, I mean, I, I got no shame in asking for help. I mean, there's there's none of that. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's important. But, you know, it's, and with the whole Coca-Cola thing, like I, I remember it was like How's It Made or one of those TV shows that was on like Discovery or some shit. And it was all, you know, the, the manufacturing behind the scenes. You know, and I, and I love watching this mass production of widgets being made. They're where they're cranking out like a million M and M's in an hour. You know, kind of shit. You know, right. and to think about how they had to sit back and manufacture these machines or products or programs to be able to do it, but there's still a human component to that. You know, in the thought process. And if you think about like assembly lines in like the automotive industries, you know, those guys exactly. are hanging doors or putting lights in or whatever. It's just an assembly line. They got to have everything down to a certain time or that car's gone past to the next person and now they're missing some part, you know, or whatever. Right. You know, and it's not for Hopefully everybody. It doesn't get to the street. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. And it's so true. <laughs> it, but, you know, it, but it's, again, it's like it's hard to wrap your head around it as a creative person because I know when I first started this stuff and I was doing the Renfest and I was making these little dri- drip drop pendants. We called them dragon tears and it was just like a teardrop shape. And I would spend like 40 fucking minutes on this little thing. And my master, he's like, he grabbed it out of my hand one day. I'll never forget it. He's like, stop right now, turn your torch off and come over here and watch me. And he like drew like four stripes down a fucking like 12 inches of some 12 mil and twisted it up a little bit and then made like 10 pennants in like 30 minutes. And he's (laughs) like, I'm only paying you 75 cents a piece. So you can make a dollar an hour or you can make 20 bucks an hour. I had to sell them for this amount of money. So it still doesn't make sense because I'm paying you this much. I'm not getting the production idea, blah, blah, blah. It's like, don't be an artist, be a, be a production person. And then the art will eventually come. Right. And it, you know, and it took that, it took me having to sit and watch, you know, and, and cranking out the production, but sit and watching him. Cause like for my apprenticeship, I did six months of in the shop, sweeping floors and tying strings and filling bottles with glitter and all kind of crap before I was even allowed to touch a torch, much less look at it. And then, once they felt I was ready, that's what I started doing was like some, just some basic stuff. But I, what I took advantage of is when I was, my first six months was just sitting and watching him work and crank out this production. And it was like, he'd make like 20 dragon bodies in a day and just shaping out the bodies, not even doing anything else to it. You know, adding the scale texture, he had some, you know, points of reference where the arms and the legs and the shit would go. And then the next day he'd pull them out and get them hot and then add the legs and add the details. And then the next day he'd take them out and then add the wings to it. And next thing you know, in a week, yep. he's got like 50 fucking these big giant dragons out. He was selling for 250 bucks, you know, right. and, they, and they would sell. And that was what, honestly, when I saw him on site at the Renfest to talk, start the conversation, that's what he was doing, was doing production dragons. And it really, really caught my attention because I, I loved it. I was like, man, how are you doing this as an artist, but also as a business? Like, it was just completely intriguing to me. Totally. Totally. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's what I, that's what I try to share with my guys here, you know, and. 
I mean, uh, you know, that was my, you know, my teacher, Ron Glass. He, uh, you know, he, when I was working with him, he was mainly doing production, um, you know, nice production, you know, big inside outs or whatever, like nice, nice stuff. Um, but like when he got the opportunity to do something creative, like for one, you know, he knew what he was doing and he was able to just pull it off. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like taking a stab at something. Um, and then like, you know, after I left, he ended up uh, making a big transition and going straight into, you know, making a lot more of the heady, heady stuff rather than doing the production. And it's like, I don't know, I think that's kind of what, you know, that whole uh, 10,000 hours theory, you know, it's like, I think we see that a lot, at least I do see it a lot in our, uh, in our industry. It's like 10,000 hours doing, you know, little inside out spoons, but all of a sudden, like, right after that, like, boom, you know, like making really nice rigs, mm -hmm. you know, like you learn so much through that process. And, um, yeah, definitely see that. Yeah. But, I kind of think it's like the 10,000 hours per technique, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. You're probably right. hundred <laughs> percent. Right. Yep. Dude, that looks I'm, uh, it's crazy. Yeah. I'm right there. I'm finally able to, you know, I was having a really hard time with, uh, doing, um, the buckets and like, you know, putting buckets on, uh, mini tubes or whatever. And, uh, finally all of a sudden everything clicked, you know, and I was after I did probably 150 mm -hmm. and, uh, so now I feel comfortable with it, but yeah, it's per technique. I think you're probably a lot more right about that. Yeah. But you know well, what, man, I, I think too, like it's the importance of taking classes and continuing education and this kind of stuff. Cause then you could have saved the 150 pieces by going and spending yep. 500 bucks on a class over a weekend and then bam, got that yep. shit. I mean, yep. obviously you have to go home and, you know, and still figure it out, but still you you know. No, you're totally right. Totally right. And, you know, we don't, I, I don't have, I mean, that's kind of one thing that is a little bit of a bummer in, out here in Illinois. Like we don't have a ton of opportunity um, for that stuff for classes and for, you know, I mean, I, but that I'll just tell on myself, I'm being, you know, I'm definitely being lazy. I mean, there's definitely opportunities I could have taken that would have, uh, that would have helped for mm -hmm. sure. You know, and I don't know, I'm about to go through this whole thing about, you know, relearning a lathe because I have scientific experience, but I've never done any artistic side, any, anything, um, in our industry on a lathe. So I'm going to have to be, uh, I'm going to be doing some learning and I have a couple of buddies that, you know, have a lot of lathe experience around here that are going to be able to help me out with that. But yep. Everything is, uh, 10,000 hours, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's important, man. And, and again, you're going around, you know, the circle of friends around you, you got to bring some cats in that know how to work with lathe and they, they're going to help you out. You know, that mentor mentorship kind of concept. Right. It's so big. Yep. Have yep. you already, have you already sat down and like began the process of thinking about what lines of work you're going to do? Um, I'm, I'm definitely doing that. Um, I have kind of one so far that I'm uh, pretty confident that I want to have is like a first line. You know, just really something pretty basic. Um, and yeah, kind of going from there. I'm also a little nervous as far as like, you know, not even really knowing what my limits or where my struggles are going to be. So it makes it hard to kind of determine what I could do, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, like I don't even know what my restrict, what my uh, issues are going to be. I know I'm going to have issues that I don't even know that I could have issues about, you know. So yeah, you more or less bought we'll yourself see. a new race car and you're not even sure if you can drive the thing. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, I, I did, uh, I did scientific work for like three years. Right, so, right. you know, I, I definitely know how to, how to get how, my way around, you know, what'll be weird, what'll be different will be like, you know, more elaborate perks and like just different types of seals that I will be new. I mean, I know that I can, you know, get down to it at first, um, with some basic stuff, but mm -hmm. it'll be, it'll be a process. Yeah, man, it's fun. And I think that's what's the beauty with the glass. It's, it's like it's a constant growth and learning process, you know? Totally, totally. Yep. And, you know, it'll be it'll be weird to have, like, my bench torch and my lathe right next to each other. So, you know, that's going to be – that's what I've heard is kind of one of the confusing parts is, like, what to do on the bench and what to do on the lathe and, like, trying to make both work. Um, a lot of people go to, like, one side or the other. Mm -hmm. Um but then I also have a buddy that, um, you know, does work on both and he'll, he'll just be, he'll be working on his, on his bench torch and he'll shut his bench torch off, go over to his lathe, chuck it up and, you know, get right back to work, you know, not even putting the thing in the kiln and, um, just like that, 
that smooth of a transition. And like, that's kind of what I'm uh, looking forward to, to be able to get to that place. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, is it a bench top lathe or is it like a full size? For this uh, it's a, it's, it's a bench top. Okay. It's um, yeah, it's uh, a red star. It's the, it's like 550 pounds. It's six feet wide. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, uh, it's a nice machine. Nice. And it's, the guys, the guys about, they man, they, uh, Dave manufactures them like seven minutes from my house. Oh, so awesome. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty perfect. Yeah, because so, I know like uh, yeah. when, when taking that Steve size of class a couple years ago, he works on a on a table, like a Litton, I believe it was, a tabletop. It's like, you know, it's got like a four foot bed on it and uh, right. maybe maybe even a three foot bed. But anyways, it was fun to watch him because he had his torch on the tabletop and then the bench lay right next to him on the, on the same bench. So it was like coil set up and then Steve size love and Steve had, you know, the lathe there. So they were able to make all the components and stuff and then immediately go right to the lathe and start the assembly process. Totally. You know, but definitely learning. It's definitely, you know, I know the times I've been behind a lathe. It was, I don't know. It's just, it's such a, it's not, the, it's not the, it wasn't the challenge of it. I think it was more of the, the time of just like sitting there getting the glass hot, you know, like I'm learning the hot shop right now again, in a sense. And, I'm learning how to relearn patience of just waiting for things to get hot or waiting for things to get cool to a point to where you can work it. You know, it's a whole different animal. So it's, uh, it's good though. It'd be good for you. And then hopefully you can, yeah. you know, take all those skills and just combine them all into some badass work. <laughs> we'll see. I'll, uh, we'll see. Uh, hopefully, hopefully. I mean, you know, the, the hardest thing about working a lathe is that you don't have, at least in my opinion, my experience is that you, you, gra you're working with gravity in a totally different way. Um, like you can't change your pitch, you know, like you can when you're working on a bench. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be a little bit interesting. And then like all those, uh, times where I was like, Oh, that's straight enough. When I was on my bench will not be straight enough anymore. Yeah, exactly. when I put it into the, yeah. So hopefully it'll kind of tighten some things up too. But yeah. Yeah, it's yep. the ultimate having to be on center. Because I know like in the hot shop, it's all about like one of the first things I was taught years ago when I did the hot shop was how the setup is the most important part of the process. Like getting your gatherer totally. centered and getting everything, even before you even add color and go to blow some air into it. You know, this that initial setup, it's so important. It goes with anything when you're attaching a blowpipe, a punny, or a pulling point, whatever the hell you're doing. You know, the shit's got to be on center. And then, and then you can make what you got to make. But other than that, man, it's, and it, you know, I love the whole correlation with life. It's the same way. If you're, if you're not on center in life, then man, everything else around you is off balance. Totally. Totally. Yep. Yep. Do that. And it's yeah. easy to just walk through life, not centered, <laughs> you know, it's just like glass. It's, <laughs> it's easy to say, fuck it. I'll just get through it. And you know, and then you learn bad habits and bad routines, which then affects everything that you make. And then going on with life, it affects everything in your life. Just by saying, fuck it, I'll just get through it. I'll deal with this limp or, you know, whatever you're dealing with. Totally. And, and you know, sometimes that's even things that are, you know, just surrounding your life, you know. Um, I don't know. I we uh, like I was saying, like there was uh, some issues with someone in the shop. And, um, you know, after uh, things got cleared up and um, we all we went our separate ways, you know, things around the shop seemed to kind of come together in a little bit of a different way that it, it hasn't felt like it has lately um, for a long time, you know, and it's like got to be on point with that stuff and, um, you know, straighten those things out when you can, whenever you know, and then, yeah, life just works a lot more smooth. Um, you know, and that was actually what drove me to go the lathe route because I was looking at uh, possibly getting a bigger shop going. Um, you know, I don't know. I've been uh, told that one of my, you know, I don't know. It sounds kind of egotistical, but I was told one of my strengths in glass is like teaching it um, because I, I'm not, you know, I'm not anywhere where I want to be artistically. But, you know, like I know the fundamentals like the back of my hand so I can actually share that stuff. And so I was thinking about getting a bigger shop, um, doing like a 12 bench studio. And I know there were some issues that I think you had with that, uh, like a bigger shop or whatever. And mm -hmm. I don't know. I um, that was kind of part of the determination to not go that route, get the lathe and then go bigger later. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's easy to want to just step up and get into that bigger space, man. And it's just like, I know for myself, it didn't work for me because I had other things that were going on. So right. my focus was, was so split up that in all reality, I mean, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't, I sucked at everything I was doing, <laughs> you know, being a dad and a husband and, you know, business owner and employee, the whole nine yards. 
So it's definitely, right. you know, you, you can't spread yourself too thin. It's, it's easy to want to do and to grow that fast. Cause it's, you know, we can all see where this industry is and where it's going and where it's been. And you know, the success that's been out there and still is, and it's just, it's, it's easy to want to chase that, you know, that carrot out there and there's lots of totally. carrots being dangled. Just got to yep. put the blinders on and stay focused and then let opportunities come to you as they come along. Cause I'm sure eventually, you know, if you get a lathe dude and you, and you step up that production line, you're going to probably want to get a bigger space just because you're going to, you're going to need the space just for keeping inventory and you know, whatever else you got to do. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And uh, you know, and the other, you know, the other piece that'll be nice is like, you know, I'll be able to break these things down for, you know, the other guys in the shop, just like I do with my other production, but you know, we'll be able to actually, you know, it might be three hands making a $75 uh, tube, but everybody does a different part and everybody's able to get paid. And like, if I can bring everybody in the shop to a level where everybody's making, you know, my, 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 uh, goal is that everybody in the shop can be making about 50 grand a piece. And then when we get, get to that point, then everybody's comfortable and then we can move into the next shop, you know, and that's kind of what, that's the goal around here at least. So dude, that's awesome. Yeah. 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 I'd be able to be in that position to support and help other artists. You know, it's, it's pretty cool, man. I definitely, uh, look up to you and like I was saying before we got recording I was listening to the last episode and it was getting me all fired up just listening to you know your story and your your beginnings and going through what you went through to where you are now it's just you know it's 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 pretty badass I appreciate it appreciate it good people around me and you know and I don't know I like to uh I don't know man I, I think you know life is about you know definitely taking care of your family and taking care of things like that. But as much as, you know, look, you know, we, we both listen to a lot of these uh, entrepreneurs and stuff. And, you know, I think one common theme across the board is, you know, those big, you know, those big guys giving back, you know, um, whether it's pencils of promise or some other sort of foundation or, you know, uh, giving their time to help other people, you know, uh, Warren Buffett, you know, he, he gives his time to help, you know, uh, investments for different foundations. And it's like, you know, I don't know. I think that's kind of half of this life, you know, like you got to do that stuff. So, yeah, it's important, yeah. especially with the, the ability for us to have this lifestyle of freedom to schedule our time out and to then dedicate time to doing charity work or, you know, like the Michigan glass project and those guys, you know, the different things that are going yeah. on. It's just, it's incredible, you know, and, and and it continues to grow in this industry. I mean, really in the art world in general, but this industry specifically, it's one of the unique opportunities we have to work together and collab. And, you know, like that, the giant piece they auctioned off for like thirty five, forty thousand $40,000, whatever it was this last year. It's right. You know, who would have ever thought that was ever going to be a thing, you know? Well, and yeah, I was, uh, I was talking with uh, ruckus gallery and, you know, they're out in like uh, the East coast and they were saying that now they're starting to have art collectors come in, and you know drop forty thousand dollars on a piece and it's it's not ever going to get used it's just for the art mm -hmm. you know and it's going and i don't know i i, I kind of was joking about it it's like that's the bathroom art piece because they got a million dollar painting on the wall you know like that's the type of stuff that you know the those collectors are starting to come to us finally and it's uh it's going to be a trip that's for sure yeah it's, it's um, true dude like habitat uh down in west palm area they they have you know a pretty big glass collection down there just you know functional and non-functional art and there's there's locals down there that probably don't even know it's a pipe like they were telling me a story that some guy bought a piece right. he had no idea it was even a pipe you know and, right totally. and, then, and then he called him up was asking some things about it you know and they're like yeah blah 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 and he's like okay cool <laughs> now that i know i'm not using it but it's still pretty cool that this nice. can be used nice. you know and i think it adds a little bit of extra bonus to the value of the fact that this thing is functional you know, it may not serve the best function per se, you know, which I, I know a lot of times, sometimes the function can be sacrificed for the art, you know, but overall, you're right. You know, these collectors are coming out and spending 25, 35, 40, 100 grand, 120 mm -hmm. grand, whatever that, like the last Sagan, whatever that big collab they just had out in Vegas last year at Champs that sold, it's like $100, right. $150,000 or some crazy shit. It's fucking. It's and then that Grateful Dead piece that just came out. I mean, it's crazy what some of the some of the pieces are going for now. Yeah. But yeah, it's mind yeah. blowing. I love it. Well, uh, yeah. You know, I was also thinking, you know, as far as uh, like, you know, giving back and everything, I think it's really cool that you're starting to do that, uh, that school that you're going to start launching soon here. Like, I think that there's still like, uh, I think we're in also a weird spot because all these guys think that they can learn everything from YouTube 
And, you know, I don't know. I got a guy that came in here and he was on a torch for like four years and he could barely make a spoon and he learned everything from YouTube. And then he was here for like literally two days and he made a perfect spoon, you yeah. know, like, and it, it's just, uh, I don't know. I think the direction that we can still offer is, is still there. And I think it's cool that you're doing that, um, on an online presence. Yeah, man. Thanks. Definitely yeah. Neat. Yeah, you know, and like just like you like listening to a lot of these business podcasts and, and the online space and the online marketing and sales and stuff, it's you know, it's being done in other genres of business, whether it's coaching or what have you, you know, lifestyle, marriage, relationship stuff, whatever it is. But our space hasn't really had that. And there's you know, my, my ultimate goal is to be able to create a some ser- a, is what is what I'm gonna do is create a series of classes to take that's gonna give you a foundation. So you can go watch the Dustin Revere videos or you can go right. take a class from somebody and you already have this foundation established that allows you to go actually take a class and actually be able to learn and what pick up what it is that they're that you're learning because like you're saying this the youtube generation's there and they only understand what they're seeing on on the video and then also from what they're learning by trying it and you know it's there's so much there's so much foundational stuff that's not being taught that needs to get out there and that's just kind of you know ultimately the goal because i'm going to do like the the first the first class is going to be a 12 week course it's just intro to fundamentals like really basic so it's the first you know month one solid work month two is hollow work and month three is putting the two together and then i'm going to do nice. a, an intro into fl- uh pipe making and then i'm going to do a critters and creatures sculptural class it's like going to be like just like a month class but the pipe making one's going to be the same thing it'll be a 12 week course that's going to take teach the basic fundamentals of pipe making you know how do you make a, a, a pinchy one hitter how do you make a fucking spoon <laughs> you know everything because if you can make a show sp- roll out bats though don't show anybody the rollouts. Okay. I'll try not to. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like this most simple thing to do. <laughs> yeah, but that's our secret, you know? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> people are asking me how I, how I make them. Like, I have some guys make them super cheap for me. And on uh, Torch Talk, I had some guys ask me. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. I don't know how they're doing it. You know, I don't know. But just a joke. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's, it's it's very simple. Thing, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, the critters and creatures one, like I'm stoked about that. I'm going to want to take that class. I mean, uh, I don't know. Sculptural stuff is like something that, uh, my apprentice is starting to do. He's messing with skulls and stuff. And I just, I don't know. I have no, that doesn't make much sense to me. Mm -hmm. So I love the work that you do. I'll I'll definitely be taking one of those classes. Yeah. Thanks man. Yeah. It's, you know, it's all, it's all about just breaking it down. You know, like I'm going to show how to make an octopus. And I know a lot of cats that do octopi or, or octopuses is actually the right pronunciation for it. But, uh, <laughs> you know, they'll make all their tentacles ahead of time and then attach them to the body where like the ones I do, I actually will build the tentacle right onto the body itself. And it, to me, it gives it a more natural flow and look to it. But it's just because I know the glass and to be able to add color to it first and then do, to shape it out, it's it's not always the easiest thing to do. So like a lot of the stuff will be done in clear first and then you go step up to the color, you know, but it's fun because I'm, I'm working with mountain glass. So like when you sign up for the class, you'll actually get in the mail, you'll get your materials that you need for the class. Like, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm, it's, oh, it's going to be an actual online, you know, we wanted to call it the university, but we're not accredited quote unquote. So it's going to be the Institute. That's going to be the Institute right. for the advancement of flame work and technologies. It's kind of long, but okay. that's what we're calling it. And it's the, the idea really, again, it's like, you know, it's going to be a lecture, a lab, and then I'm going, do, I'm going to be doing a weekly one-on-one coaching the whole nine yards and uh, not to give too much away, but I'm going to be talking here pretty soon in some future episodes about uh, the our beta test program. We're going to be offering to three artists to come on to get a super big discounted rate on going through the class with me just to go through the process of it to make sure everything works before we launch because it launches in July is the actual start of the classes. Nice. So, nice. But yeah, we're pretty, oh, yeah. yeah, we're pretty excited about it. So it's, it's, uh, you know, going th- and you know going through the process of being self-taught more or less. You know, I've learned things obviously from other artists, but mostly just from trial and error. And this whole thing for this class is the same way. I mean, I'm sure you you know how many people saw my video of me knocking my fucking dry erase board off my garage and my light falling and blowing up in my garage. I mean, it was a it was <laughs> it was a temporary little setup just to practice the process of filming and editing and stuff. But you know, it's like this stuff I got to go through to learn this shit. You know. <laughs> Hell yeah, hell yeah. You know, and then the video um, editing is a whole nother thing. Jesus. Right. Well, I think I think that's that's dope, you know, like, I mean, I had, you know, I had my teacher for my first year, and then from there, I really was, for the most part, self-taught after that, and like, you know, I, um, you know, all the fundamentals that he taught me was great, and it's helped me get to where I am, 
but like you know we're talking about you know the lathe work with uh you know making tubes and it's like you know, my head goes straight to like you know it would be nice to have a sculpted perk in there that you know actually the you know air travels through the mouth of the of the skull or whatever but like i need to be able to make the make the damn skull mm-hmm. like i could do everything else no problem but like this is where i'm i'm starting to kind of get to that plateau i guess is uh you know where i'm at yeah man you know I'll, i'm gonna i'm gonna actually write from this poem i cut this off out, out of the show but um just a kind of a side note well let me know when you get this going and you get to a point where you feel comfortable because part of you know with this whole thing with my wife and that's i mean uh, she's pretty much checked out so like i'm looking at probably like the end of april starting to pack up my shit and get you know move out to orlando kind of deal um so i'm gonna actually have like a ton of free time to be able to do what i want to do with this show which is to travel and visit studios and stuff and with my job now being full-time i'm gonna get paid vacation and blah 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 so i can afford to like travel and oh fuck it'd be a killer dude to come up to your studio and and record like for like a week of like lathe work 101 with you dude that'd be dope you that'd know, be fucking dope that we could offer yeah. you know offer that kind of course and then sit down and figure the business side of things because what the long what the long-term goal with this podcast was is to do the actual interview on site with the artist in their studio in person and then do a collab with them and then do a video of the artist teaching something you know, technique wise as like a, you know, nice. a triple threat with the show as a, you know, when each episode comes out. So that's, that's, that's my dream. But my, the goal with the classes is to be able to have it as a certification. So like when you actually graduate from the course, you're going to get like a real diploma on that. You can hang in your studio saying you graduated from this course, you know, because oh, yeah. there's nothing worse than, you know, like Rashawn Jones and I talked about, we're laughing in episode 100 about like, you know, imagine some jackass comes to your house because you need some electrical work done. He's like, yeah, man, I saw this on YouTube. I can fix your plugs for you. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? You can let this motherfucker come into your house and burn your house down, you know? Totally. And totally. with the way this industry is going, it's, you know, it, it, depending on our, the politics and stuff. But however, I really feel with legalization, eventually it's going to get to a point to where we're going to need to have some kind of certification like OSHA is going to come in and be like, you all need to figure this shit out. Cause we're going to shut everybody down until you guys are all certified and can pass the test of blah, 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 you know, like a welder or an electrician or a plumber. Right. You know? So that's, that's now, I, yeah. I mean, think about Fritz spoons, right? Like what about the guys that don't realize that you need to melt Fritz in? Yeah. Like that never been shown that, you know, if you don't melt it all the way and you got little shards of glass, somebody's going to smoke, you yep. know, it's like, yeah, there's definitely a need. Um, well, and it, you know, it would be cool if, uh, you know, sometime around glass roots might work. Um, I don't know if you're planning on coming up to glass roots this year. But, yeah, 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 that, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Hell yeah. Hell yeah, yeah, I'm bringing, uh, Nick's going to come back on too to talk about this next upcoming year. Oh, sweet, sweet, For nice. Sure. Yeah, I was just talking to him. I was just talking to him the other day. Nice. Yeah, he's good, good, good people. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, back to the recording. So, but yeah, man, <laughs> you know, it's it's important to have foundational technique and skills and you know like you in the last episode when you first came on talking about you know filling the jar with marbles that, that was how you started and it's so easy just to bypass that step but it's also so important to have those fundamentals definitely definitely and and yeah i mean it those the stuff that we learned through the, you know even even you know making the joke about the rollout bats you know i mean uh even that helps the guys you know figure out what it is to like melt an edge in you know we we take things for granted that like you know it's just second nature to us you know and these guys that are coming up like they have no idea and they're not going to catch it on youtube and they're not going to see that oh you you actually uh you know you melt in the edge of the blow tube so you don't cut your lip and the guy's going to cut his lip 10 times because he's never going to even know that that's what we did that's why the blow tube was you know safe it's like there's actually safety aspects that these guys are not you know able to learn and then also uh you know i mean then there's the whole thing of them you know a lot of guys making you know bullshit rigs that are killing our price points because you know these guys are slapping things together and it you know it's going to fall apart but the shop owner doesn't even know you got to mm-hmm. educate the shop owner too you know it's like i don't know yeah, yeah. all that stuff yeah so it's so true and i think that's what, what the fun with this industry and the space that we have is there's you know, even going through the show and trying to find sponsors and understanding like, Hey, this is a whole new thing for this industry. We got to find a way to make this work because it's never been done before. Like we're all, you know, we're trailblazing in a sense, even though, you know, there's guys out there killing it, but there's still like, there's certain central fundamental things within the industry in a business sense that we're all learning as we go. It's just, it's, it's important for us, you know, to all get some kind of symmetry across the, 
industry that's all you know price i mean price points i guess are different based on region and whatever but like you're saying you know there's there's got to be some kind of like quality control to educate the shop owners that, so they know what they're looking for why should you not buy the stuff that comes in from china compared to buying from your local guy you know blah 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 some people right, don't give right. a fuck about that stuff but it's you know those that do are are seeking the knowledge and don't know where to look necessarily so it's up to us as as artists to help educate our customers because then they're going to spend more money with us. They're going to spend more money with the locals instead of spending money with this stuff coming in from the local import distributor. Right, right. Yeah, I had uh, I had a shop owner complaining about um, you know my rigs at what they cost or whatever, and he he grabbed one off the shelf and he shows it to me and he's like, yeah, check this out. This is American made, and I didn't really believe him in the first place. But um, and like, what do I see right away? Is this crack coming right off the joint all the way around the can? And I'm like, uh, that's cracked. And he looks at it. No, 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 that's fine. I'm like, no, dude, that's a crack. Like, you don't want that on your shelf. And um, I don't know. I think I ended up seeing it back on his shelf later on. But he did buy my rigs because they were clean. You yeah. know, it's like yeah. but trying to trying to educate is, I don't know. Some of these guys are too stubborn to even care. But, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, man, I, I remember seeing some pieces that were, I think it was like, the hell was it? It was, it was a green sparkle. I don't know if it was the old millennium moss or, but there was some green sparkle back in the day for inside out that just checked every time. And mm -hmm. this guy had a whole shelf of them and they were all checked and he thought it was like dichroic glass. And I, <laughs> you know, and I'm showing him like, dude, those are all thousands of cracks in that piece. He's like, no man, no way. It's all, it's, it's dichroic glass. I was told it was, you know, I'm like, all right, you believe what you want to believe, but here's dichroic glass. This is what it actually looks like, you know, kind of thing. Right. And then he right. understood, you know, and then he pulled them off the shelf and called the, called the guy to come pick his stuff up, you know, kind of deal. You know, right. so it's, it's, right. you know, again, it's as, as we educate ourselves, we got to pass on that knowledge to those that are, that are buying and, and supporting and getting the glass out there into the industry. Cause when Definitely. the, you know, yep. when, when the customer buys something, that's a piece of shit and don't realize it's a piece of shit until they get home and then it falls apart, then it's, it puts a bad taste in their mouth. It's like with podcasting, like a couple guys I listen to, they're like, we want to teach proper podcasting and setup for audio quality for free because we want to make sure that if someone turns your show on and it's the first time they've ever listened to a podcast that they're listening to something that's high quality and not being turned off by some piece of shit sounding podcast that they'll never listen to shows again because they assume all podcasts sound like that right you know right hurting the industry yeah big yeah time. i mean why why spend you know why spend the money on a nice you know, american-made rig if it's going to just fall apart you know just go to china it's like you know it makes sense in a way and like that's that's what's a shame you know i mean I try to keep my mouth shut as much as I can on the Facebook groups just because, like, I don't want to, you know, I don't know who knows who and, like, who, you know, what toes I'm going to step on if I say anything. But, like, some of the times I see stuff on there, it's just like, Jesus, dude. Like, either raise your prices. Sometimes I'll send a personal message. Like, dude, raise your price. Like, that's ridiculous. You're going to hurt this for everybody. Like, you can get another three bucks out of that. Like, you know, or the or the quality and the quality stuff. I stay away. I just don't need to get into a pissing match with somebody. But like, yeah, it's a it is part of what you know part of what's going on. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I, I as much as I enjoy Facebook, I try to stay away from it because I know myself. I try to I turn into to daddy and teacher, and it just doesn't go well. <laughs> you know, Rashawn and I like no, I, I bring him up because him and I sit. We're like we're like the old men on the front porch. Like, get off my grass, bitch. You know, because, <laughs> right, you know, right. we'll go in there and see some of these kids that think they know what the hell they're talking about. And they've been behind a torch for like three months and they're like, yeah, do this, this, this and this. And I'm like, dude, you're telling them the wrong fucking thing. Are you wearing glasses while you're working, too? You know, like <laughs> just sunglasses, dude. Why, why, you know, sunglasses work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it's yeah, funny dude. stuff. It's amazing. So it's it's important that we we continue to teach the proper knowledge out there and, and correct those that are sharing the, the bad stuff. But again, you know, I don't want to get into a pissing match necessarily. Right. You know, something, uh, I guess I'll th throw out there, um, you know, to your listeners or whatever. Uh, I did start a, another Facebook group, um, geared towards glass blowers with catalogs. Um, because a lot of these different groups have, you know, you're selling cases and, you know, pre-made stuff. And that's kind of what, I, you know, I'm referencing when I see like the garbage on the, on there or whatever. Um, but this, this other page that we're trying to get moving a little bit is really geared towards like artists that actually have lines and like have um, experience with that and and ha and uh, a place to be able to get orders from rather than selling cases of pre-made stuff. Um, so it's a and it's a pretty 
I don't know. I am the moderator on there, so I feel like I can actually say something to somebody like, hey, man, you know, pull that out, pull that post down. But, you know, take some better pictures like try this. Don't don't take them in the case. Like, go set five of them aside, take a picture of those and then put some bulk order pricing on here. Um, and I, you know, I don't know, kind of one of my ways of trying to help a little bit with like the business side of how to how to promote yourself. And um, yeah, getting orders are always nice rather than making cases. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's smart, man. What's what's the Facebook group? Uh, it's glass blowers with catalogs. Okay, really simple. Yeah. Is it just? I'll uh, I'll I'll add it. I'll add you to it. Okay. And then cool. you'll be able to see it. Yeah, yeah. Please yeah, do. Yeah, just. Yeah, glass blowers with catalogs is all it is. Cool. I think it's yeah. a fantastic idea because, like, part of what I'm going to be doing too with this with the the pre-launch, um, some of the video series I'm going to be giving for free are going to be like how to take the right picture, you know, with the setup, you know, with the general basic photo booth setup you know, how to do a proper live stream, you know, from your studio with the, with the way live streams are going now. And, uh, I put together this little kit where it's got like a didymium lens filter and it's got a tripod and it's got a little Bluetooth remote control that controls your phone. So you can just, you know, from a distance hit on it, you know, start and stop. And, uh, yeah, it's like 90 bucks for the kit. And, uh, it's, it's, it's real simple setup, but it's so important to have that proper setup. <clears throat> and then there's like a little extra things you can add to it, like a backdrop. If you want to have like a basic white backdrop behind you to hide your mess in your shop, or you can hang, you know, <laughs> t-shirts or your, you know, promotional material on there and stuff. You can really make yourself look professional because, uh, nice, you know, nice. it's important to have, but it's, you know, it's fun. Like I remember when I was over at Zen a couple months back doing some, some, uh, Instagram live stream and there was like six of us in the shop that were all streaming live at the same time. So we were all like walking by each other's benches, like recording live, the other person recording live, you know, kind of shit. He was, I think we might've like cracked some kind of th- wormhole in the, in the studio or some weird shit. Cause it was, uh, it was getting a little crazy, but it was, it was fun. And it was neat to see, you know, the way that this live streaming has gone, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's important. To, yeah, I haven't messed with it much yet. I need to do that. But that ninety dollars setup sounds perfect. I mean, a nice little tripod and a remote switch. Like that's badass. Yeah, it's a Bluetooth that's remote. Pain in the ass part of it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll have a link in the uh, in the show notes here for for this episode. Right on. For sure, and I, and I can send you the link on the side so you can check it out. Right on. And we're, the the goal is to to for us we're going to start manufacturing our own actual uh, clip filter my neighbor next door he has a just got a brand new cnc machine so we're going to start actually with uh, aluminum start cutting them out and then getting the glass in and stuff and actually making our own because the ones you can get right now um they're i think it's like 90 bucks just for the actual lens clip on i mean you get you get a couple other things that go along with it but yeah they're a little pricey so i'm going to try to try to find a better even at 50 bucks for it or or, you know whatever to kind of get it to a better price point to make it worth the time right so we'll see how nice. it goes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. So uh, before I let you go, if there's anything else you want to, uh, I guess, kind of parting advice or just kind of summarize what we just talked about. I mean, uh, I don't know. It's all about just, you know, it's, it's a grind. It, you know, it's not just, uh, it's not all just fun and games. You know, sometimes you got to put in work. I mean, I work, you know, six, seven days a week. And it's like, I don't know, if I'm not on the torch, I'm doing marketing. And, like, that's how I can make it. You know, I just... Uh, it's a bummer seeing the kids that, I don't know, that uh, fall off because uh, they thought it was going to be a little easier. But, yeah, I don't know. Just put in the work and it uh, it pays off. That's I th- that's what I think it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. Way to, good way to summarize it, man. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah, so I hope you all enjoyed this episode with Chris Piazza at Crispy Glass. You can find him on Instagram and all the social feeds. I'll have all his links in the show notes. And until next time. We'll see you on the next episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show. Y'all take it easy. Sweet. Thanks a lot, dude. Yeah, no problem, brother. Anytime. Peace. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Glassroots Art Show. Now entering its ninth year, Glassroots is designed for artists and distributors who wish to do wholesale business with shops and galleries. Located at the Monona Terrace Convention Center on beautiful Lake Monona in downtown Madison, Wisconsin, the art show features at least 25 glass workers demonstrating and creating pieces for public viewing, live and silent auctions, raffles, and approximately 40 booths consisting of raw material supplies, functional and non-functional art, and glass charitable organizations. This year, in 2017, Glass Roots will be held October 9th through the 11th. And for any more information, just go to glassrootsartshow.com. That's glassrootsartshow.com. 
This episode is also brought to you by The Flow Magazine. Since its inception, the focus of The Flow has been to provide a bond among members of the lamp working community. This has been accomplished by developing relationships with the finest artists and sharing their techniques with you through in-depth, step-by-step tutorials. In every issue, you can enjoy great content with the hottest artists and cutting-edge techniques using the latest industry products. These features, along with the continuation of our Women in Glass edition, Glass Craft Emergent Artist Awards, inspiring gallery showcases, dynamic general interest articles, as well as health and safety information, make The Flow the leading international lamp working journal for more information or to subscribe to the flow go to the flow magazine.com that's the flow magazine.com